everybody, and welcome back to the Traders Wrap Up podcast. We're here today to talk about episode five of Traders Canada live right after the episode has aired. I'm, of course, your host, the Duke of Deception, the Sultan of Suspicion, Puizan Bikili, ready to break things down. And with me is my lovely co host, who very often geeks out over tic tac toe. It's the one and only Scally. Scally, how are you doing? Ooh, hello, hello, Mr. Attitude. Okay, I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Can't believe it's already the fifth episode of Traders Canada. I had to triple check that. But what a fun season it's been so far. It really has been a good time. And according to Karina at the, at the uh, round table, halfway through the season. So it's picking up. You know, we felt like it was a slow roll, but I'm not, you know, as of right now, I'm okay with that. I feel like ultimately, I think I came into the last episode kind of hot because we got hit with that blind the the round table blue balls we didn't get the result we needed we didn't get a banishment here we got hit with a triple treat scally we got two banishments and a murder all in one episode i know a triple eviction they're so heartbreaking <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's tough it's tough you know i really did not we made our predictions last round and uh as per usual we were very wrong um so i was very upset to see how this ultimately goes for you know many of our faves yeah, a lot of faves getting clipped out here. I especially feel like all three of them I did not want to see leave. But this is the harsh realities of reality TV. Don't hold favorites too close because when they leave, it will hurt a lot more. We will, of course, be back with three exit interviews tomorrow with all three, the two banished and the one murdered. If you have any questions for either of them, feel free to at me at Puyism on Twitter and Scally at Brown underscore Scally on Twitter at us both. That way we'll get questions in that you want to have answered and we can put them out there for y'all to take in so let's dive right on in with the episode because we picked up right where we left off last episode so last episode we end up with a cliffhanger in the middle of the round table we had seen rick vote for trevon crystal had voted for may mary voted trevon may voted rick and then trevon had voted rick so it was a three two uh, sorry two two one vote we get the cliffhanger. We come back, and it's not close at all, Scally. Mm -hmm. Absolute waterfall of Rick votes is unleashed. It was painful because I, I think we even did say like it, that was probably the closest the vote was ever going to be and once the dam broke like uh rick you know no real fanfare like all right and you're gone <laughs> we gotta gotta go rick we are all voting for you exactly so we can now open the board here if you've not watched the episode yet you do not want to see what's happening on the board look away or pause now otherwise it's too late full steam ahead boom and boom this is what we are here with rick gets banished right out the gate the only non-rick vote in this episode was kevin who voted who voted for trevon and this ends up being a big deal with all the drama that unfolds later on so Unfortunately, Rick is now gone, Scally. Tell me your feelings. Walk me through them. Oh, I'm sad. I, we saw it coming. I'm happy that, like, yes, I got, you know, even just one more week to hope that Rick was being on the show. But I ultimately am sad that, you know, I feel like it is now kind of an afterthought of the episode. Whereas if he went out last week, it would have just been, like, the peak of the episode like oh my god can you believe that rick went like how wild um so while i am very sad rick is gone i wish that it had happened sat almost last week which feels like a weird thing to say when i'm so sad about him leaving the show yeah it's interesting because last week we we're trying to put our rack our brains to figure out why did they do this did they just not have enough time but then they did everything they did last episode and this episode and jam and there was way more drama jam packed with the whole kevin and fierce of it all and the challenge and the armory i feel like and i don't know if this is a hot take i feel like the round table that was promised this episode the drama that was building up got cut short because we didn't have enough time and i feel like we could have had that time if we had just banished rick in the previous episode mm -hmm. yeah and again it's not the last episode it felt like there was a lot of fluff i was not coming in there saying wow we really could have cut all these minutes but it did feel like we stole a couple from this episode unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah this episode is where i felt the worst yeah i definitely agree i do feel like if you're going to end up watching this in the future on a binge your life is fine it's going to work well you're not going to have any issues but going through the pain not the pains but the 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 um fomo 
not even the word I'm looking for. I'm Jacob <laughs> Jones and all over the place. But basically going through the one a week journey is you can definitely feel that it is kind of tough. But again, this episode had a lot, so we can just dive right on into it. So as Rick is going, he he says he loves everybody. Great game. Ton of fun was had. Uh, you play a darn good game, especially you faithful, which I am one of. And walk so I love these one liners people try and put together when they're walking out. It's great. It's a good time. Yeah, I love them. Um, you know, Rick's my guy, but are the faithful playing a great game? <laughs> I'm not so certain about that. It's it kind of gives me the same energy that the mass singer does, where all the judges are always complimentary, like no one's getting directly taken a shot at here. Uh that being said. Rick did get a one-liner delivered back at him directly from Korean when Korean says it was another temp job for Rick. Mm -hmm. And Oof. that's the shade I want. I mean, uh, even, you know, we'll talk about our second banishment later, but on Drag Race, like the exit line is an iconic moment for Drag Race. And so I want that. Like you come into this season and like keep workshopping it with a exit line <laughs> as you go. You should know what you're saying when you get banished. And you know, if it evolves over the course of the week, fine, but let's get something good. Yeah, it's one of the few things you can you can rehearse because you're like, okay, in the event that I get banished, let me have a good line to end on. Um, and I feel like we've definitely seen that, you know, the lovely Annabelle had a great one on the way out. So you could definitely cook one up. Just think, just think about it. I mean, mm -hmm. no one wants to think about losing, but think of your line just in case for your mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, I don't think you're jinxing yourself. I think you're fine. <laughs> I think yeah. you can, uh, you know, just in case I want one more moment. I'm going to mm -hmm. have it. Yeah, take it. Uh, so Kevin continues his storyline here of in confessional. Kevin is very complimentary of Kevin and then very not complimentary of the other players. Once again, Kevin says there are some horrible, horrible players here. Mm -hmm. And everyone always talks about how if they were going to go on a reality show, they're like, oh, you don't want to give these confessionals because if you end up being wrong, they're going to make you look stupid. I'm like, make me look wrong. Make me look stupid. I don't care. I either look very smart or I get a lot of screen time for being dumb. Like, I don't care. <laughs> like, let me be the like person who thinks that they are doing everything correctly. And so that, I'm enjoying that from Kevin. I think that's the that's the right move, especially when you're on a cast of 20 people. You don't want to get lost in the shuffle. So doing this guarantees you one or the other, either really good, really bad. Even if it's somewhere in between, having that kind of boldness helps better than if you're in confession. You're like, ah, I don't know what's going on. It's like, well, we're not going to use that because like mm -hmm. we, we got precious minutes here to fill up. Um, the other big storyline, there's a couple of big storylines in this episode. The other big one, Scally, that kind of extended throughout the episode was... Travon being down on himself. I feel like Travon has survived this vote and feels like he can no longer trust this gut and pretty much did everything to prepare mentally for leaving this episode. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know what it was it's like trevon survived the episode the vote but his like sanity did not he was just done uh just absolutely after the round table you see him just like basically completely checked out and it didn't click for me as much on the first watch the second watch i was like uh like this this guy's done like he's really out of it yeah, I feel like there's something to be said about when you... Because obviously this was not a cl as close a vote as they made it seem. Trevon ended up getting three votes. So it's not like he was out the door. But I think there's something to be said about feeling like there's that perception out now and knowing you got to fight for your life. Some people don't have that in them to constantly deny, 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 and like try and set people the right path. Especially when you watch some of these vote outs, it's been an episode or a day of building on that person. And then it's a dog pile of votes. So it's not going to be the best feeling. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, the thing is that I understand it because there's not much you can do to prove your innocence on the traitors. It's very difficult. You have to be a like really good uh, debater in order to like change a lot of people's minds if everything's going. But at least go with the like, you guys all look dumb as hell. <laughs> like keep it fighting until the end, you know? So um, uh, that is my preference. Even if you are going to get a little defeated, like let's keep the energy. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about another segment that would have probably been on last week's episode, but was on this one. We go to Trader's Tower, Scally, mm -hmm. and you said we were wrong last week. This is another one in the books for Puya being wrong this season, because I thought they were going to recruit tonight. I thought it made the most sense to recruit. 
Uh, but no, they're really feeling themselves like, nah, we're good. We don't need to recruit, especially Mike, I feel like is the more vocal. I don't want to recruit because Koozie in the next Traders Tower meeting end of the episode says, I wanted to recruit the night before, but Mike didn't. And hey, if Mike doesn't want to do it, then Mike doesn't want to do it because my name's not out there. Mm-hmm. I tried to get all meta with it. I was like, no way we're doing three exit interviews next week. So uh, no, we're wrong again. I will never believe they're recruiting. I don't care if they end the episode saying which one of these three people are recruiting. I'm not believing them. Uh, so I am fully in on they're doing murders from here on out. And we are speculating on who is being murdered and maybe who is being recruited, but definitely being murdered every episode. Yeah, I definitely do think so. So now they talk about who their shortlist is going to be for murdering here. And Kuzi throws out Kevin's name, says Kevin should be next. Also throws out Crystal's name as uh, someone who she believes to be suspicious of her and also is suspicious of Mike, which we did see the part about Mike and the suspicion there. And then they called Fierce a potential wildcard choice that they could throw up there as well. So when I heard these three names, I thought, yep, my feelings are about to get hurt today. (laughs) This isn't going to go well for me. Yeah, three very active players. And I believe all three players on the red team, as far as I remember. So because Kuzi had the shield, she revealed it right away. So everyone's up for grabs. Uh, Seems a little bit nerve wracking to go ahead and put the target on uh, yourself like that potentially, but all three names I do think are valid options to consider for murder. I think so too. I really do think crystal is someone who has shown who's proven to be starting to put pieces together and is silently uh, not only sussing people out, but also gaining some influence. There's some connections that she has now that she could maybe potentially mobilize, especially if she's one of the few bringing up Mike's name. Now, here's what's interesting, because let's cut to the chase. Crystal is going to be the one that gets murdered. Um, This is now two for two in my book, Scally, of someone who threw out Mike's name and then promptly gets taken out. That is not good for Mike. That is good for Koozie. Mm-hmm. But Mike's the one who wanted to murder. So I'm really questioning who pushed harder on it ultimately being Crystal. Uh, my question is like, look, I think Crystal was a very fun player, a pretty good player. But like, could we have just murdered Crystal one night later? <laughs> like, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, if when she wasn't on the winning team with the shield, uh, I, I think that is, about it. you know, I think that uh, there are arguments for really any of them like was this the like absolute must murder uh this round whereas someone like probably let's say i don't remember who was on the winning team last week but let's say leroy or mickey like are they drawing like a ton of suspicion um if they're not murdered today versus next time so uh yeah it's tough i don't know yeah, it's so so this is a very good time to bring up exactly what we're talking about here where if you've noticed the three people on that list we're all on the winning team last episode in the challenge. Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, the challenges don't matter on the show. Why are we talking about them? Because the red team that won that challenge in Kevin, Mary, Gurleen, Crystal, Leroy, Fierce, and Kuzi had a trip to the armory. Kuzi wins the shield in the armory and then tells Mike about it. And then they took someone out. They murdered from within the safe team, so to speak, because again, The big meta move with having the shield or going to the armory as a winning team is if we don't tell anyone who got it, we're all safe because they're not going to take a blind shot. Now, they clearly take a shot within this team because they know Kuzi has the shield, so they have no worries about missing their shot here. And I got to ask, Scally, do you think this is a fine move or do you think this is a big mistake or is it somewhere in between? I argued for taking the shot within the winning team in a every scenario except for the one where you have the shield. I feel <laughs> like uh, that is the toughest one where you could have someone like even if let's say Kuzi's on the winning team and someone like Kevin has the shield and like, oh, we took the shot at Crystal. She goes home and they're like, oh, well, this is weird. Kevin or someone else, probably a worse player, uh, like could say like, I had the shield (laughs) or like, you know, like actually guys, like I'm being honest, like I have the shield. I'm trying to build trust and like, I'm really not a traitor. So there's a chance that it could come out there, but you can't like reveal yourself to have the shield as as a traitor. I think that's like way too ballsy of a move. I think killing within your own team is already uh you know uh, bold enough so I, I think it's probably a mistake yeah here's my thing 
I like the premise of shooting within the winning team. Obviously, if you don't have the shield, you might miss. You might hit someone who is safe. But on the off chance you're not, let's play it out. Let's pretend for a second that Fierce is the one who had the shield and not Kuzi. They still take the shot at Crystal. They don't, they're going to breakfast. They don't necessarily know Crystal's about to be murdered. So Fierce can walk in with shield around neck, flaunting it. Look who had the shield last night. And they're like, oh yeah, and Crystal died. Oh, oh, and, and here's the thing. I think a lot of these faithfuls have proven that they may have looked at that as a damning piece of evidence that, hey, Fierce is bad. Fierce got to go. So there's debates to be had there. This does worry me because we've talked about how much the faithfuls have little to work on. This could very well end up being something that they're going to zero in on and focus on until it solves itself. Now, do I think it's a sound strategy as faithful to just systematically vote out everyone from the red team? Of course not. I think that is a horrible move because <laughs> if there's one traitor in the midst, then you might be getting that. But I think after you get three faithfuls out, you might have to abandon that altogether because, hey, maybe the traitors were both on the other team and they just took a blind shot and hit it anyway. So I don't think you should worry about it too much. I also think it depends on who is the person who's lying. And Kuzi has proven to be a good liar. I don't feel like Kuzi's face is giving it away. I don't think she's doing anything much. So for now, I think it's fine, but we'll see if it comes back to bite, bite them or not. Yeah, I am not thinking that Kuzi is like, definitely going to be caught off of this but i just mm -hmm. think that it brings unwanted eyes definitely i think that's definitely i mean it, there was better safer options to go through without any consequence for sure there now we get to the morning time and uh we do see some murmurs coming in some conversations coming in because i feel like this is where we start seeing a little bit more from mary and the key thing I wanted to point out, Scally, is that in the breakfast time, we do see Mary saying that she was going to vote Rick, but she heard his defense and felt like it was the wrong move and doesn't, doesn't vote for Rick. I believe Mary did the exact same thing at the round table this night. I think this is a bad, I mean, innocent, but a bad time to have that kind of uh, read from Mary because I feel like who's the who are the people that will know for sure someone's good or bad? It's the traitors. So if you are vocally being like, yeah, you know, I was going to vote here, but then I didn't because I figured they were not it. It's like, okay, well, you're trying to make yourself look good. You're trying to like prove innocence. That's suspect. So I feel like Mary accidentally is ending up in this spot, which is only going to get confirmed by a couple other people too. Yeah. I think that especially if you were a traitor and you used to the pin that on mary that would be great because here i am thinking like well if i'm a traitor i'm just trying to blend in so mary's not blending in and therefore is maybe even a little more faithful because she's willing to take shots so it's so hard when anything could be anything but i think that it is a very interesting pathway to uh search down absolutely so let's talk about the main thing that happens in this breakfast scally the mm. start of a feud fierce walks in kevin's already in the breakfast fierce walks in and is stone cold to Kevin. Stone cold. What did you think was happening here? Because I had no idea what this would have been based off of. Because I thought, I feel like they would have shown us them having a fight or hanging out after the vote and something went wrong. It had nothing to do with that, Scally. Oh, no. I was like, oh, Fierce saved Kevin a seat at breakfast last time. And Kevin didn't save Fierce one this time. <laughs> so they're mad. And <laughs> look, like, I just want to sit next to Kevin and I get it. Like, he's fine. Uh, but no, <laughs> this was definitely not what it was about. No. So turns out Fierce isn't happy that Kevin didn't vote with them at the roundtable. That, hey, I was saying, Rick, I was so sure I had this read. Why didn't you follow me into this incorrect move? This doesn't come up, though, at breakfast because Fierce kept saying, I'll talk to you later, Kevin. I'm not going to talk about it right now. So that was funny. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the dramatics of not even like, yeah, it's I'll talk to you later. But it's also like, oh, Fierce, what's up? I hate Kevin. <laughs> like, oh, OK, <laughs> like absolutely going 10 out of 10. And I appreciate that. Yeah, I did find it interesting that we do see. Kevin talking to some people and saying, hey, if I had pulled a vote like that and I pushed someone out like Fierce did against Rick and I was wrong, I'd come in humble. I wouldn't be acting this way. So I believe Kevin is also getting rubbed the wrong way about this. This isn't like innocent, like, oh, no, Fierce, let's fix this. It was like, a, 
why are you doing this to me? We're friends. <laughs> so I'm yeah. mad now that you're mad. Well, that's the thing. I think it just became emblematic of a problem that Kevin realized he was going to have to face later in that Kevin's looking for predictable players and Fierce is proving herself not to necessarily be that. And that's going to probably create future problems. Yeah. What Do you have the exact quote that Kevin said about uh, Fierce in that you need three things in this game? Was it heart, instinct, and one other thing? Heart, head, and instinct, I believe, and says that Fierce is only playing with one of those. Is that head or heart? I think it would be heart. I think we were, okay. we're going here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. that's what we're going with. I think we were going on emotions with Fierce. Yeah. So once Crystal is uh, pronounced murdered, this is when you see some of the people talking about this idea that, oh, the call's coming from inside the house. Someone on red team had the shield, was the traitor, and then took someone murdered with it from within which by the way is also a very like still but it, it is true in this instance it's very true it's a far-fetched theory to be like yeah w- the one person out of the seven safe that we didn't want to get the shield got the shield and then used it against us I, I feel like it's just as bizarre to think that way but again they're right here and do you know what's even more wild? The first three into breakfast are Donna, Leroy, and May. And May says, without knowing anyone else who's going to come in, wow, do you think it's possible? Wouldn't it be wild if someone on the red team won the shield and murdered within their own team? Wouldn't that be absolutely wild? <laughs> I don't know how that never came up again. <laughs> For some reason, May was not a sus. May was purple in this episode, completely invisible, not talked about, not, we didn't get to see much of her either. So somehow May has gone into the background despite having the 1v1 against Rick in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and she does catch a few votes. So I was kind of surprised where uh, she is pretty purple here, not really getting a large edit. But something tells me, like, maybe this will be a flashback. Maybe it'll be like, oh, remember two breakfasts ago when May said this thing? Uh, let's, let's bring that back up now. Well, to be fair, wasn't she sharing that with Donna and Leroy? Yeah, okay. I mean, my thing is Leroy seems like he holds on to things and is a little difficult to change his mind based on well, some of the conversations I've seen. I feel like and, and very much in the next scene, we see Leroy and Gurleen talking about this whole shield drama. They talked a little bit of breakfast as well. So I do agree with you. I think that's what Leroy is focused in on is I'm going to play detective in the case of who is the traitor within that red team among us? Who is the one there that did this? And I feel like I can't help but feel like a little bit of why the vote ends up being Fierce at the end of the episode could have been because Fierce was on that team as well. Because if you look at it now, Scally, the ones still alive within that group moving forward are Kevin, Mary, who quite a few people think is the traitor, um, Gurleen, Leroy, and Koozie. There's five left on that from that group at the moment interesting yeah it's tough uh i don't know i I think that um you know there's a lot of like uh intersecting trust within that team and especially with some of the alliances we find out about this week i understand how mary is really catching uh some heat here thinking that it is probably her uh i think that probably they would not suspect leroy of making a move like this um so i can understand why they maybe think it is mary now My question is when everyone is going around talking about this theory, Kuzi does try to shut it down pretty quickly, saying that she thinks it was a blind shot. Do you think she should be pushing this or kind of taking a backseat? I feel like the key is how often is she bringing it up? Because I feel like you throw that theory out for sure, but you listen to everyone else's theories as well. So you play along with them. So if someone's like, ah, you know what? I think it's this theory. You know, that does make sense because like, who came in first? Oh, you three came? Yeah, that makes sense that Opai was someone from our team. Although I feel like that might be too much. Maybe it was just a blind shot. You know what I mean? Like you got to like offset it a little bit by clearly listening to someone else's theory and then putting it out versus just being on defense mode and trying to like pepper that in everywhere you can. Yeah, it's a hard balance. And so, but I think that the like, I don't know, this is probably the best move, unfortunately. Like, uh, maybe it was on our team. Maybe it was the other team taking a blind shot. Maybe they're both on the other team and they wanted us to look inward and that was their thing. Like, you know, I think you can't be too certain. And so that's the only worry I have. The key with this cast so far that I'm noticing is that you have to come off empathetic and compassionate. So you were on that team. You should also be worried and upset in some manner of ways because Mel... A, Melissa A does say 
that she feels like Mary is the one and feels like it's Mary because Mary didn't seem too sad at the uh, the last uh, was it, I believe the banishment didn't feel didn't seem too sad about it or was it didn't seem too sad during breakfast. Yeah, um, I think they were saying during breakfast that uh, were we saying Mary might be a traitor because she doesn't seem like a oh, rider. True. She doesn't seem like a ride or die girl uh, today, which I'm always trying to give off ride or die girl energy. So uh, <laughs> misstep by Mary that she wasn't acting as sad. I don't know. Maybe she and Crystal were pretty close, apparently. Uh, but yeah, I think it's tough, like, because people that are not traitors are just acting on their normal emotions. And Mary's just maybe not that emotional of a person uh, in this scenario, but people are picking up on it. And, and Melissa was also insinuating that. Mary got rid of some like that's someone that was close to Mary that's gone. So now that that person's gone, you wouldn't ever imagine or think that it would be her that is bad. So that's another piece of the pie to uh, consider as well. So early on, Mary's getting some suspicion on her. But Scally, let's go to the main event and let's finally dig into this Kevin and Fierce conversation. You want to start th- start us off here? Oh, yes. And I think that it's still at this point, like Kevin's approaching it as if like, all right, this is something probably pretty lighthearted and Mm -hmm. we can move past this. He's like, oh, hey, what's up, Mr. Attitude? Uh, Don't ever call me that. (laughs) Like (laughs) Mr. Rude and Mr. Backstabber. Uh, So Fierce is not happy, is very frustrated that Kevin did not vote with them last night. Like explain why we had the suspicion and we were all going to do the vote and then you don't follow through. Yeah, and I love it was so funny to me because Kevin was basically saying, Listen, I didn't in my heart, I didn't really think it was Rick. I also knew where the votes were going. I knew my vote didn't matter. And effing Trevon was pissing me off. So I ended up throwing a vote his way. A petty listen, we love a petty vote. Throw a petty vote sometimes when when you're not happy. Um, but I don't know how much I loved Kevin saying to to Fierce's face, you were wrong. You were dead wrong. I don't care how wrong someone is. I don't know if I would say that. I don't care how close I am to them either. I don't know. It's tough. I think that you could probably convince someone else of this. I don't know if Fierce is the person that's going to (laughs) uh, accept that as an answer. But I think that Fierce is very correct. And when she calls out that, like, I will always just be a pawn in Kevin's game. Kevin is playing this game really hard and expects me to do what he wants and not question what he does. And, uh, like, that's all I'm ever going to be. So I don't think Fierce is wrong at all in, like, questioning, like, okay, we're in an alliance and you're not doing what you said you were going to do anymore. That's immediate red flags that I already have on you. Yeah, and and Kevin tries to offset this by saying, listen, I have your back. And, and you're good with me, I'm good with you, but we also have to play individual. We have to float through the game. Like, we can't just be, like, fixed in on a thing. We have to be, ad- I guess I'm, what I felt like he was saying was, we have to be adaptable. We have to be willing to roll with the punches. And to me, it was very clear that Fierce had no interest in rolling with any punches at all here. Um, but this is where we do find out about an alliance that we did not know about. So allow me to bring my mice mouse pointer here. What am I doing with words tonight? Um, so... <laughs> Scally, we have the Fierce Four in Kevin, Fierce, Koozie, and Gurleen. This foursome is called the Fierce Four by Fierce. And then Fierce insinuates that Kevin's going to be out of it, and it's going to be the Fierce Three. Now, obviously, mm, yeah. Fierce <laughs> is gone. So Kevin, Koozie, and Gurleen left in the game as a trio. This is so funny to me, knowing that Kevin with his whole chest believes that Mary is the traitor when Koozie's the traitor. It's so mm-hmm. funny to me. <laughs> very, very funny. Yeah, I'm making an alliance over here. Well, you already have an alliance with the traitor, Kevin. You're doing just fine. Uh, highly <laughs> standable alliance at that. So, um, yeah, I have very ironic that Fierce says it's going to become the Fierce Three. Uh, doesn't know that he is ultimately going to be the one that will be leaving the alliance tonight. But uh, glad to have this on screen because that's the thing is the, uh, the game only actually becomes more interesting, I think, when people play, like, not the original structure intended, but try to use the structure to their benefit. And these alliances are very interesting, so I'm excited to see that play out. And this is exactly why I had tweeted earlier about Kevin, because I agree with you wholeheartedly. I feel like, obviously, from the outside looking in, the traders is basically a mafia where You got to get the baddies out if you're good. You got to get the good people out if you're bad. End of story, end of discussion. I think there's so much more nuance to this. I think there's so many more layers than things you can look at. And Kevin highlights a lot of things that I think you need to consider 
if you're playing this game as a faithful. Namely, Kevin's strategy when he a lot when he talks about it and, and like places it out with Gerline later is that we have to work with the trader. We shouldn't just be getting rid of the trader. And he says, I think Mary's a trader. I do not think we take the shot at Mary. I think we work with Mary because Mary will keep us safe, which is 100% true. And then they try and get other people out. Additionally, Scally, another thing I love from Kevin was he said that he wanted to drive a vote and miss. Basically do kind of what May has done, kind of what Fierce has done, where you're like, it's this person, get him out. And then it's not them. You're like, oh, God. Um, see, I'm clearly not that good at this game. Mm -hmm. It's hard because... I think like okay, good. It means that you're not you don't your reads are not as perfect, which like mm -hmm. they're already not Kevin with the 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 Mary read apparently. So you're like, I think you're fine. Um, but at the same point, it, we always talk about in the early game where like oh, there's a medium and they're gonna point it to someone, and if what happens if they point it to you and you're the traitor and like they're so influ influential, doesn't matter that they're wrong sometimes, right? Because they're just influential and that's fine. Now if Kevin is wrong but influential he's still just as dangerous as that medium and like they still could be you know happen to lightning strikes twice you hit another traitor and now all of a sudden i'm gone because you are influential so it's hard it's definitely better i think than getting all of the traitors out immediately because they'll just be replaced anyway um but i think the influence is still something to be scared of Yes, which is why I think if we're going to fast forward real quick, I think he lucks out by not taking the shot at Fierce and having other people do it. He's blindsided. He kind of gets exactly what he wanted. Where he's like, oh, what I thought was going to happen didn't happen. And other people did, which they now maybe they could be looked at. Because I do think I, I was perplexed at the end of the episode when he said that he was blindsided because I thought, Kevin, you did nothing but plant seeds all day. Like if they And they ended up doing the vote anyway. So... I don't know if it's going to come back to being him. We'll talk a little bit more about that roundtable later because he does throw out some names other than Fierce that I think are worth discussing later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation with Kevin and Gurleen because I thought it gave a lot of insight into how Kevin is playing the game uh, where it's like, we're at the final 13, but if we make this movie, we can make the final eight. And I think we're going to be like potentially murdered in the last two rounds. And he's like, do you know how we don't get murdered? She's like, girl, how? Like, I have no idea. And I'm like, same. I don't understand what you're saying. How did he <laughs> jump from 13 to eight? That's what yeah. I want to know. And I know that earlier he also did, like, we got the um, insight to the Fierce Four, but a kind of like a uh, not as straightforward uh, moment. Kevin does also outline, like, there are different sides of the house. Uh, and there is, like, you know, the Fierce Four, but also, where does he talk about? It's like the Leroy and... Um, like Melissa and Dom side of the house. And I think Mickey, uh, and it's like, and they're all working together. And like, I kind of want to make a move over there and Donna. Um, so I think that there are very much sides of this house. I don't know if that side is as firmly uh, aligned, but I like learning more about these dynamics that we're not seeing. I'm very excited to learn about them, especially because I think our girl, Girlene is in the center of a lot of them. Cause we talked about the fierce four, now Fierce 3, we've also saw a lot of Leroy and Gurleen talking about the S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff. I feel like there's clear connections here. This really felt like Gurleen's episode um, mm -hmm. with the amount of confessionals we saw from Gurleen narrating the episodes. I did love seeing that. And I'm with you. I want to learn more about these dynamics. And I only think it's, we're going to get a clearer picture the smaller we get. So I think the edit is actually doing a really good job of introducing a lot of these pieces now that we're halfway through the game as well. Yeah, and oh no, for a second, I, for a second, I thought it might have been Leroy and Gurley and that Gurp was trying to talk to before he left, but I do believe that was May. So maybe I was trying to like, all right, are Leroy and Gurley <laughs> a little power duo we're not seeing? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like if I remember correctly, it was Leroy and May that he was trying to mm -hmm. to get together and talk to. Yeah. So all right, you know, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Let's quickly yada yada the challenge um, in a way. The challenge was this is a classic one that we've seen where they go into this church place and there are people sitting in the church. They each have a distinct piece of jewelry or or watch or what, what accessory of sorts where there's like different shapes, the moon, the stars, a heart, whatever. And then they got to go into the confessional booth. The host gives them a clue. They have to run back to the book that the clue is going to be in, and they got to find the clue and then solve the riddle and get the piece correctly. $6,000 up for grabs, Scally. First team to, I guess, the team that gets two out of three wins the armory reward. Otherwise, that's it. 
Mm, yeah, the first time I watched this challenge, I was like, oh, this is fun. This is cute. And then the second time, I was like, all right, I'm a little bored. And then the eighth time, I was like, this is the biggest snooze that is on the traders, I think, maybe. Um, I could need to stop watching this, please. Most of it is just them flipping through a book. Uh, I don't know how playing poker makes you better at reading pages of numbers, but sure. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I don't know. This is The only, like, missed opportunity I saw here is uh, when they go into the confessional booth, it's like, anything to confess. And they're both like, uh... No, like throw a joke. You got to take your your moments when you get them. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to hear my maybe hot take? Scally? Uh -oh. I was thinking about this today as I watched the challenge for a second time because I watched the episode twice. Um, I thought, you know, not often am I going to watch a challenge on the traders and be like, oh, that was scintillating, like incredible TV. The only time I can really think of it, I think, was the finale of New Zealand. I really love the challenge they did there. Otherwise, I don't really care for this. It doesn't really do anything for me. So I'm actually way more okay with it being a repeat of a challenge I've seen on other franchises of traders as well. Because I don't have to pay that much attention to it. And I can just keep my ears open for any one-liners that I hear a zing of some sort or some shade or basically who was running it and who messed up. And then I can move on. I don't have to like pay triple attention to like something new i'd rather something new still i mean look it's nice that i have a minute to check what you're tweeting uh during the episode but otherwise um like it's fine i mean i guess i learned that dragonflies eat mosquitoes and that's well hey, known that i didn't know gurpyar helped out that team how about that with that mm. bitter bit of information from beyond the grave shout out gurpyar yeah, outliving his time on the show and getting a little mention here. So that was good. Um, but otherwise, the challenge was boring. And can I also just say, I think the armory segment is really boring, too. That's two minutes of TV what? that I don't think we get back. You, you don't <laughs> like seeing seven people go inside and open an empty case? Oh, God, I just wish that it was like... Okay, there's like all of them entering in a montage. We get like, you know, five seconds each of them. And then like it comes up on whoever is opening. I don't need to watch like, okay, the person got it. And now three more people still have to come in and deliver 30 seconds of dialogue. <laughs> I watched it twice. And in my second viewing, I had forgotten that Mickey won the shield. <laughs> and then Mickey won the shield. I was like, I'm keeping this to myself. I was like, Mickey, they're keeping you to themselves, too, because they're not showing you uh, us <laughs> you. We're not seeing you on this show. So congrats on your shield. You're probably safe for a minute here. Yeah, it's hard because the strategy of like, oh, we just won't tell anyone who got the shield and then everyone's safe here. It's like, well, then I don't really care who got the shield. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I don't care to watch who like you all open this. Uh, you know, rarely does it ever matter. Uh, it just so happened to matter this episode specifically and never before. Can I hit you with some with a with a move? I feel like they could have explored here. The traders specifically. Please. If the traders had both gotten on the same team. And then their team loses the challenge here. They could do exactly what they did the night before, kill someone within that group. And you have to imagine there's at least two or three people overlapping in both teams. They will have more sus on them. They get to escape that suspicion completely exonerated. Mm, I don't know. I just feel like if like Koozie is on a second team that they murder within the winning team. Well, like, that's what I'm, I'm getting... saying. She would her and Mike would be on the losing team. OK, if they're on the losing team, then I like that a lot better for sure. Um, yeah. You know, if there is one person who's overlapping, but I feel like these people also have been pretty quick to call out, uh, for example, when Donna was being set up. So I think that they might almost be like, all right, well, Mary was on both teams. Like, it can't be Mary. That's too yeah. obvious. Uh, so I do worry about that. This is funny, though, because we're on episode five. Four of the episodes, two of the episodes out of the first four had the challenge mattering a lot in the murder that happens. Uh I don't think any other franchise, the, the challenges have mattered this much. No, I do agree. Yeah, it was all about like, okay, we got to keep challenge strength and uh, look out for this losing team because they could not get like a sentence together before mm -hmm. the other team had already won the challenge. Um, so I don't know who who was the weakest here that's going to be murdered next week. Yeah, oh, so it's fascinating to me that Kevin in this episode was talking about how he kind of wants to intentionally could don't come off that he's not having the best reads not performing his best because he's gaining that reputation of being really good but in the two instances where he did come up short aka being kind of like the main leader in the challenge and then also later in the blind side not only was he not a part of those but he admits that he choked he admits that he choked in the challenge um which again i think helps him 
I think that benefits him, even if he didn't intend on it. Mm, so he's trying to like shake that challenge beast reputation that he earned on challenge on a uh, Big Brother Canada. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the move is here for Kevin with that. I don't know why that's helping too much. No, no, no. I just meant like because he was saying how he wants to be perceived as less mm. effective in everything that he's doing. So it's but like then oh, he wasn't throwing. Kevin? He's fumbling yeah. in the challenges. He's fumbling with his reads. He's not a threat. No, he fully choked it. And you know how I know he choked it. And he's being honest about that. Because when Fierce held up the coin and flaunted it, you saw that look on Kevin's. Kevin was <laughs> hating it. Kevin wanted to win so bad at that point. Yeah. Oh, I mean, also because Kevin would have been in confessional like, you think I lost this challenge? I threw it and I'm outsmarting everyone else in the yeah. house. Like he would have told us. <laughs> exactly. Um, so then once the challenge is done, one thing I did want to point out was on the drive back from the challenge. Uh, we had a moment where in May's car, May's like, so no one can say I sabotaged today. That's not a thing that happened. And Fierce said, yeah, well, Rick is in here, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> also outliving his stay. Oh, Rick. <laughs> oh, Rick. What a yeah. weird argument to have put on May, but sure. Listen, again, no other franchise has the challenges mattered the way it, it somehow matters yeah. in Traders Canada for some reason. Um, so then we start seeing the, the lead up to this round table. And this is when Kevin starts to plant the fierce seed in a lot of places. We see him do having a conversation with Trevon and with Mike. Uh, and in this conversation as well, he's like, yeah, you got to be suspicious of everybody. And Mike's like, yeah, like you're probably suspicious of me. And he's like, well, I'm more suspicious of Trevon than I am you, which I thought was interesting given what happens later on anyway. It was interesting. I also thought weird of Mike to be like, yeah, well, like you're totally suspicious of me, but like, that's okay. It's like, he didn't say that. <laughs> like, why are we trying? Like, I don't know. I, again, I just feel like there's a couple of um, unforced errors that like people like where it's just like draw as little attention to yourself. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in the house, people are drawing as much attention to themselves to try to like not get murdered. And like Mike is just trying to keep up. Uh, but uh, who knows? It seemed like a uh, unnecessary sentence for me. What? Well when Mike came into, first of all, Mike had this entrance where he did like a little magic trick. And that, when I say little, it makes it seem like I'm downplaying it. But it was the one where like he turned something into flames as he walked in. And then he has a confessional where he says that he feels like he's been very much quiet and needs to contribute more in the lead up to this day. And really put some names and feelers out there in, in this day, which... I feel like this is kind of showing us him trying to trying to do that, but in no world am I ever bringing my own name up. Mm -mm. No, and that's mm -mm. the thing is, it's like okay, you want to get more involved in the conversation, be like, has anyone ever looked at Dom? Uh, you know, so <laughs> they had one confessional. No one's talked about him all time, but uh, otherwise, yeah, you know, no one's talking about that guy. Like, be the first to bring up someone random's name who you don't really need, and like maybe even like, well, you know, I'll bring up Dom's name now, and then we'll murder him later. <laughs> like, who cares? Like, I can get him off the board whenever I need to, and clean up my loose ends. So, uh, bringing up someone else's name seems like the move. Not your own yeah what did you think of may's confessional when kevin was planting some of these seeds um i thought it was interesting i mean in the traders like you have to always look out for signs and i think that may was saying like all right kevin doesn't want to appear too sketchy and so he's being very forthcoming right now like look how trustworthy i am and that's what a trader would do now i do think it's good to like keep an eye on like Kevin is really playing this game hard and that is a sign of what he's doing here. But I don't know if it makes him sketchy and trader like to be doing this necessarily. If I'm a faithful that is not as active as some of the other players, this is, I feel like this is music to my ears. If you're playing hard, good. Come with me to the end because at the end you'll probably get banished or murdered because you're either a threat as a faithful or you might be too faithful to seem like a traitor and I can slide in. This is music. This is perfect. I'm not putting your name out. I'm going to befriend you and ride with you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it might have been the preview, but I was surprised when they're talking about like the quieter players in the game and May's name gets brought up. I was like, May? A uh, quiet player? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe she's not like actively bringing up as many people's names that are, I guess, in the house. Maybe Rick was seen as like a retaliatory, uh, whatever that was, uh, <laughs> like move rather than, you know, proactively bringing his name up. But I was surprised to see that May is possibly thought of as a backseat player. Yeah, it's interesting to me because I feel like the traders are almost getting to a place where they should be taking out a quiet player or two because everyone who's being vocal can start being suspicious. I feel like Donna at this point is so faithful, no one's going to look at her and she's sliding to the end. So if they somehow decide to look at quiet players and like a Donna gets sniped out as a, in a banishment, that is so good for the traders. They're benefiting massively from that. Mm hmm exactly and so uh yeah that's why where you know crystal looks very innocent and we question the murder because uh, there's a couple uh, like of the golden boys left here where some of these people i'm having a hard time seeing where they get banished yeah they have to get murdered like point blank or they slip up by doing something last second that people are like, you know what i've not looked at you all game now i'm looking at you let's vote you out so we'll see we'll see how that shakes out so scally we end up in this, uh, we end up hearing from Trevon where Trevon was worried about going. And then he says that on his, on the way back to his room last night, he had a full on breakdown. He was going through all the motions, wasn't feeling good. And it's funny. I mean, okay. Funny is the wrong word. Right. <laughs> it's, sad. it's sad to see him going through all of this when then you're seeing other scenes of people essentially saying, yeah, there's no way Trevon's bad. Trevon's not going anywhere. Um, I think he's convinced some people that he is not a traitor. And I feel like that is not easy to do. You know, we oftentimes watch these shows and people just have this traitor stink on them that they can't take off and they eventually just get gobbled up by a banishment. So I wish Trevon wasn't as hard on himself because you did something right, friend, that they're not looking at you. Yes, your reads have not been great. Okay, I'll, I'll level, I'll agree with you there. But you survived two banishments when you thought you were going. That's something to hold your head high on. Mm -hmm. And usually, like, on paper, Leroy seems like the type where I would expect him to be, like, pretty warm and, like, comforting. And, you know, like, oh, like, keep your head up, kid. <laughs> like, whatever. Like, any of that. Um, but I feel like he's <laughs> kind of just like, hmm, okay. Oh, you had a breakdown? Okay. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> like, I didn't really get a lot back from him. And no maybe bedside manner. <laughs> yeah. There was not a lot, at least, uh, edited into the episode here. And, you know, when he... Uh, was talking with Melissa back when she got banished uh, of just like, yeah, like I have my read and I'm probably going to go off of that. So we didn't get a lot there. But then to see uh, Melissa A telling like uh, May and Donna that she doesn't think it's Trevon actually. And like, but do we just go with it or do we bring up Mary's name? Because we're pretty sure that she is a traitor. Yes. Yeah, so this is where Mary's name starts coming up here. And then we also obviously see Kevin does think it's Mary, but has no interest in taking Mary out. So I got excited, Scally. I felt like the buildup to this was fun. I thought, oh, my God, maybe Mary gets blindsided and we have to see because we have not seen anything from Mary since episode one. Basically, I feel like where we saw Mary and Kevin talking and Kevin had said and they both agreed Melissa B is probably a traitor. And that's where they had landed. So. I was excited for that. I was excited for the Fierce and Kevin saga. I thought that would be fun. I was excited for Trevon to kind of self-destruct a little bit at the at the round table. Ultimately, the round table was a lot shorter than I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I blinked and missed it. Um, so I don't really know what <laughs> happened. Um, but no, yeah, I thought the same. I thought that uh you know i would question kind of like hey, you know it seemed like after colin mary was one of the ones that was kind of leading the anti-kevin charge in the first episode so mm -hmm. the to to find out that they've gotten to a point where they're working together is interesting um but kevin coming in and basically like throwing it right at mike after saying that he distrusted trevon more and then changing the subject to fierce and seeing you know there were a couple quick bites where people were like actively making their case but we didn't get you know super detailed discussion here no definitely not um the one last discussion we got before the round table was Kevin and Gurleen going back and forth on whether or not it's too soon to take the shot at Fierce. Like, we want Fierce out. We think Fierce is 
if fierce going will only benefit the two of us he needs to be off the board however should we wait one more round before we do that should we start the opposition but then not do it until next round what did you think about all this? Because I I felt like for Gurleen, it sounded like Gurleen didn't have a good enough reason to get rid of Fierce and would have had some suspicion thrown her way had she done it. But I was I couldn't understand Kevin's reasoning necessarily. Um, I mean, I understand Kevin's reasoning for keeping Fierce in in terms of like if the traders think that Kevin and Fierce are probably going to be targeting each other at the next round table, then ah, yes, that's a good reason because like, all right, why murder them when they're like, if I take out Kevin, then like mm -hmm. Fierce's target is going to be aimed elsewhere when I could keep their targets firmly planted on each other. Uh, reason enough to keep both of them in. And so I understand waiting the round mm -hmm. and I understand Kevin's read of fierce being potentially uh a unpredictable player but at the same time you already have like your goal is to have fierce coming for you mm -hmm. and so once you've accomplished that there's not really much else that you should be too worried about unless fierce like suddenly turns on like and points his target at girlene like i don't really know what else we're like worried about here i feel like we missed an opportunity to have a kevin and fierce moment where Kevin goes up to Fierce and says, hey, so if we both seem like we're coming after each other, they'll keep us in. I need you to pretend to hate me. And Fierce is like, I do hate you. I feel like we missed this opportunity. <laughs> that yeah, was Kevin the thing. Right I was secretly like hoping that was the case. I was like, please get along. Um, and so unfortunately, it was not. And this was uh, genuine. Uh, friction between the two of them but i did also enjoy girly and being like so what should i do and kevin's like oh no no, no. i have to figure out what i'm doing first basically <laughs> like <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense from you i have to figure out what i'm doing exactly so, uh I, i'm i'm enjoying girly and i think that she is showing she has like uh the desire to play this game very actively and i'm excited to see what she can do playing with kevin or potentially in a post kevin game if that were to happen we need to see that play out. I'm very excited for that. And I feel like this was the beginning of it. So mm -hmm. more Gurleen. Thank you very much. Okay. So Scally, I feel like something that a lot of people are thinking about and a lot of people will be discussing after this episode, after having watched this episode is Kevin bringing up Mike's name and actively saying that Mike, you and I, we play tic-tac-toe and you are a nerd. You're a gamer. You geek out over tic-tac-toe but I do not see you geeking out about this game. And I feel like that's strange to me because you haven't had any theories. You observe and you reflect. You don't really contribute. And that makes me feel like you're 20 to 25% a trader, but I'm not 100% sure, obviously. I feel like this is a very good read from Kevin, obviously, that he's recognized something like this. But I still think that Kevin doesn't know that Mike is a trader. There's no world he brings out Mike's name unless he fully thinks that Mike is basically a faithful. Yeah, this was tough because it's like all the reasoning was really good. Uh, I really liked this from Kevin in terms of it's almost like the like I see your eyes light up and I can tell you're telling the truth. And when there's no more sparkle there, uh, that's when I know that you're lying. And so when Mike's eyes are not sparkling talking about this game, he's not actively trying to figure out the meta and all the ways around it. And what is uh, the most efficient strategy like he is with a game as simple as tic-tac-toe, then it seems to be a big uh, tell. But when Kevin is convinced of mary being a traitor and he's trying to keep her in the game but he's not convinced of mike being a traitor and he's trying to target him openly i think that is gonna potentially be a big problem for kevin it's a bit of a wolf moment it's a bit of a wolf moment especially because i feel like every again all the strategy stuff he's laying out there good times good smart i like you know you gotta make alliances with the traitors and the faithfuls love all of that i want to make my threat level lower love all of that but the big key ingredient in all of this is you got to know who the traders are. And unfortunately, right now, he's got two pieces mixed up. Two end pieces that look very similar, but they're not the same. You got to flip them and then you're good to go. Um, so he puts that out there. And now, obviously, the last two people that were murdered did have Mike's name out there a little bit. So could this be foreshadowing that Kevin's not surviving the night? I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think so. 
Uh, well, yeah. actually, he was in the preview, so literally, it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I so. generally don't watch previews, um, mm-hmm. but I did watch this one. So, uh, yeah, I think Kevin's going to be just fine. Maybe three for three going after the people that bring up Mike's name at roundtables would be too much. Yes. Then also, also not to be like a like a nitpicking type of person. Have you ever geeked out playing tic tac toe? What is there to geek about? I mean, geeking out is a strong word. Like, I am very competitive, so am I going to try to actively win uh, and sit there for maybe a second longer than I should thinking about my moves? Like, maybe. Uh, But geeking out seems strong. Tic-Tac-Toe lost its luster for me after you get to, like, the fifth, sixth grade, and you've all figured out the strats, so you're just tying nine times out of ten, and then... 10th is like someone finally wins i was like ah let's just rock paper scissors way easier yeah grow up play connect four (laughs) (laughs) add another extra layer to the grid folks what are we doing here (laughs) a real man's game (laughs) (laughs) i like to drink beer and play connect four with my bros (laughs) (laughs) i don't like either of those things anyway um okay (laughs) So then it's funny because Mike genuinely feels like gets a little defensive here and says, no, no, I mean, I listen, I was the first one to speak out and get rid of Mel B. What, like, why are we not? I led that. And he's like, but I don't think you were a leader of Mel B. Absolutely not. I do not think that was the case. Now, obviously, the first person that had noticed that and called that out was Crystal, who's no longer with us here. So there wasn't a lot of backing there. But then they moved swiftly on to Fierce, obviously, who was always going to be the main topic of conversation here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was interesting to be like, actually, you weren't. But more importantly, fierce. <laughs> like, what are we doing over here when you were so loudly wrong? Uh, what happened? Why did you, uh, you know, go ahead and yeah, 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 come into breakfast so like, off this morning? Like, what happened? Can we find out? Can we see what's going on? Can we figure it out? Um But it's so funny because Fierce not showing, I guess, remorse for having voted incorrectly, led a charge incorrectly, really rubbed quite a few people the wrong way, it seemed like, where was this the most vicious people had gotten in a banishment so far with their one-liners as they revealed their chalkboard? Hmm, I don't know. It didn't say fierce. I am not sorry. Uh, so I, <laughs> <laughs> maybe aside not from quite. May. Aside from May, uh. <laughs> you know, one of the most. But like, watch, you know, Drag Race Canada. I don't think Fierce was ever really going to show remorse for getting someone out of a competition. Uh, I think Fierce is a competitive player. I think Fierce uh, <laughs> is, you know, looking at this as a game and knows what makes good TV mm-hmm. and is going to deliver. And I feel like it's one of those things where what do you want someone who got it wrong to do? Repent? Be sad? Sulk? Because the reality is I'm not here. I'm not like sitting here and watching the rest of you five, six people that voted with me being silent like you didn't do anything. You voted there. I listen. I can say a name. You voted with me. You can't just put all the blame on me. That makes no sense. I would have actually gotten irritated if I was fierce in this moment, but um Mm -hmm. especially when you have kevin's like what i need to do is i need to get a vote on a wrong person and the next time i'm gonna pretend to be sad it's like well you just wanted fierce to pretend to be sad (laughs) like i don't know why that is more valuable than her just coming in with honest feelings you're not sad enough about this person leaving and us all getting one step closer to winning anyway i don't like that (laughs) i don't exactly yeah um and and it's so funny to me though because like you you look at the rest of the board here and you know how many people have gotten spearheaded votes and then gone out the next day? You know, mm-hmm. like this is, I don't know. I feel like the fierce is unapologetic. I'm like, you shouldn't do that, obviously. But I also find it ridiculous that there's like eight people thinking, hmm, you didn't show enough remorse. I think the added layer, obviously, for Kevin was not only you didn't show remorse, but like you were giving me heat for not voting with you. And it was a wrong vote. So why are you mad? It's like saying, I got a B and you got an A in this test, and it's because you changed one of your answers after copying my homework. Why? Why didn't you take the B with me? That's not fair. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It was interesting, but at the same time, we moved on from fear so quickly as well, from Mary interjecting and taking charge instead and moving it to Trevon. Mm -hmm. I was 
floored to see that this ends up being Fierce's boot episode, let alone like honestly anyone. So like I was like, okay, maybe Trevon had just kind of like given up on the round table and been like, it's fine, just vote me. Like, it's fine. Like, I don't care. And like we were just like yada yadaing because there wasn't a whole lot to show uh that was compelling. Um, but no, for some reason we just get an edited down version of Fierce's boot. This is one of the, and this is going to be my number one question asked in the um, exit interviews tomorrow. What did we miss from this round table? Or how long was this? Because again, I felt like this was going to be a long, this was potentially going to be our best round table yet. And I feel like it kind of got cut half where then once Mel, uh, Melissa A and Leroy bring up the shield stuff again, and people start denying that they didn't have the shield, we just immediately went from that to time to vote. And like, time to vote? Where's the fight? Where's the arguments? Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, everyone immediately was like, not it. Like, it was not me. <laughs> like, I didn't have to do the shield. Um, I think probably what it is, is we end up getting what? Like, one, two, three, four, five, six votes on Fierce, I think, is what ends up sending her home. Maybe one or two more. Um, seven. And seven. Okay, I missed one. Um, so... And almost every one of them is like, I thought it'd be the only person. Like, I thought I was throwing, like, a rogue vote, and I was just, like, putting my mark on, like, all right, but for next time, we got to vote out Fierce. And I thought that it was a done deal in another direction. So I'm wondering if maybe this roundtable barely did focus on Fierce. And it was like, well, we have no content to show that makes this make sense. Let's make it a short one. Fierce did say that they didn't hear their name come up at all and like no one was really talking to them about it. So that's something to potentially put into consideration. But I have a hard time imagining that this was just a bunch of people rogue voting it because Kuzi yeah. obviously was thinking of going that direction. Mike uh, did not vote. Actually, I was looking at Mickey. My bad. Uh, but Leroy is someone who actually knew about the conversations that were coming up potentially. So I don't know if this truly was a rogue vote scenario, but also the other part is a couple of people did say that they were going to vote Travon and then switch their votes. Gurleen voting may, and then Kevin voting Travon had the exact same, sorry, not Kevin voting Travon. Gurleen voting may was one of them. And I think someone else that voted fierce also had that same explanation. Mm -hmm. I do think that it was probably a couple of people. I mean, what a shame that we don't get a banishment where fierce, suspects slash knows she's the one going home because i can see her tearing them all apart on the way out i think that would have been super fun to watch fierce fight for their life uh so i am disappointed that we did not get that and instead it's kind of like oh and uh because everyone changed their votes and we don't really know I'm like all right bye fierce yeah and fierce gets up and says congratulations uh you took out a faithful bye-bye I'm gone now. Uh, so there we go. Fierce is now out as well. Kevin feels very much left out from this vote. Uh, Leroy, Mary, Kuzi were all the ones that claimed they changed their minds at the meet at the round table. Um, Mary did say as much um, that after Trevon defended himself, she did not think that Trevon was a traitor and switches it to Fierce. I was like, when did he defend himself? <laughs> like, it was like, you guys need to start looking elsewhere. And she's like, yeah, okay, man, we'll yeah. do. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All Trevon said was look beyond the obvious. And then that was it. That was yeah. really it. Because also Mary does bring up uh, that the lie about the job thing was also something that she didn't understand, which I was like, that's a good thing. Fair point to bring back up. So again, the fact that Trevon lied about a job came clean, then had all this suspicion on him and has now survived two banishments. I think Travon is a player you will never, should never murder because I do think eventually this will all come back up again in like three weeks and they'll banish him anyway. I really do think that'll happen. That is the thing for me is I felt like on the last two votes, I was surprised that Travon was not voted out, uh, especially that the traders weren't jumping on it a little more because Travon's not someone that jumps out at me immediately as like, oh, this person's definitely going to get voted out at some point during the season. Whereas Rick and Fierce, like, I can see it. I can see how this is happening, how they're like bringing the ire onto themselves. Uh, so it's like, all right, well, while it's here, let's take the shot uh, while it's available. But I do agree. It feels like it's probably going to like rear its head again at some point. But poor Trevon, if Trevon was giving up now and then we got three more weeks or whatever it is, I'm just like, well, it could be Trevon. It's like, just send me home. Like that, <laughs> I understand it. <laughs> like five weeks in, goodbye. Don't do yeah. it. 
I'm ready to leave now. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay. So now we get to the Traitor's Tower. It's the last scene of the episode. And we do see them celebrate. They're, we're a good combo. We're doing really well. And Mike wants to murder again. And this is where Kuzi says, I would like to recruit. I think we should recruit. She tells us that last night she wanted to recruit and Mike didn't. We get a knock on the door. Assuming it's Kareen. Episode ends. We don't even see what the conversation is. Now, obviously, this is, there's a couple ways this can go based on some other franchises that we've seen, Scally. Do you think, A, that this is the hit list coming back where they got to not pick three people and one of those three is guaranteed murdered that night? Just before you said that, that was the idea that popped into my mind. Because I was like, it's, is it late enough in the game to do like a forced recruitment? Like this is the last time you could potentially recruit. Mm -hmm. I don't, I feel like episode, like, well, we're going into episode six. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think it's like the late enough. It's late enough to say like, this is definitively the last time you could recruit. Can I tell you what I would like for them to do? If this Please is the hit list twist, I would like to see a twist on the twist where, okay, you name three people. One of them is guaranteed to get murdered after this next round table. However, the extra layer to this is, and one of them you have to recruit at mm. the end of this round table. Um, I, as I think that is a good way to go about it because that way they'll pick people that they would want to either have get murdered or they might want to recruit into their team. And then it'll be interesting to watch them try and like prevent that person from getting banished and stuff like that. So I feel like that could be some intrigue to it because I really feel like it's either the hit list or it's a, you have to recruit tonight. I don't see it yeah. going any other way, really, but I have to imagine it's most likely going to be the hit list. Yeah, I do think that that's likely. I am very interested in that twist because it unlocks a whole bunch because then presumably even if one of the three people were to get banished at the next episode then mm. whoever like Ooh. you're murdering one and you're recruiting mm. the other like there's only two like take your option um so that is very interesting i think that it unlocks a different layer in choosing that you're not thinking of because especially uh what if say mike was like i gotta end up on this hit list i gotta end up on there uh and then they murder one of the two other people or like they banish one of the two other people. And then it's like Mike and the other person. I like, can't recruit Mike. <laughs> Gotta murder him. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you do? I don't know. Yeah. Cause I think that is a fun little change to it where obviously the players, you don't tell the, the announcer to the players that, Hey, and whichever one survives, one of them, I can, no, don't do that. Obviously. But I like the idea of those three being on the list, watching them, assessing their movements and how they're reacting to this news and then deciding who you want to get in. There is no world either of these two will want to put themselves on that hit list, by the way. Let me make that clear. Mm. I do not. OK, I don't think Kuzi will want anything to do with it. Mike might be like, let me dazzle them with this magic. He's such a wild card. <laughs> like, he really is such a wild card. I don't know what Mike's doing. I truly have no idea. And I think that that is a very interesting tra strategy for a trader. Like, never let him see your next move. And I think that is uh, always what we talk about in terms of who they're murdering. Like, not setting a pattern. But Mike just seems to not be setting any pattern with the way he's playing at all. Uh, from some of these episodes. At least what we're seeing, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I have a good read on what Mike will do. Moving forward. Always keep them guessing is not a bad strategy for the traders. As long as you have a semblance of an idea of where you're headed, it's fine to take whatever route you're doing. Um, but it feels like based on the next time on that both of their names are coming up. It looks like, and again, it's the preview, so it's very difficult to figure out with the splicing and the adding of the voices in the background. But it sounds like Koozie's name is coming up. We do see May bring up Koozie's name. And we see Mike in confessional say that he's happy Koozie's name is coming up and he does not mind that happening. So mm -hmm. I feel like we're finally getting to that point of the season where these two traders living in paradise are going to end up getting a little selfish and trying to take the other out. Now, obviously, I believe, and I think you believe the same, if you're down to one trader at this point of the game, they'll make you recruit someone. So good luck. If you think you there's a better person out there for you to recruit, go for it. Uh, but I feel like you'll have a tough spot, so we'll see. Exactly. But that's what I used to be so 
uh, like when I was first watching the show, I was like, why mm-hmm. would you ever recruit? Like you are just signing up one who you are going to have to betray later. And that's going to be like, I want to have more information than everyone. Um, but as you're murdering and as you're banishing, you are crossing people off of the list. That would be great recruits and banishment. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like let's, you know, get them in and throw them away. So where for Kuzi, like, let's say, may goes home and then like you know there's only one uh like reality tv woman left in girlene like is girlene getting banished before koozie i don't know uh and you know when they get to the end are they gonna be like well there's been no reality tv people here that were traitors and we know one of them's gotta be so i think that recruiting early um or at least in the mid game can be more valuable than i used to think it was yeah, no, I agree with that sentiment as well. It'll be interesting to see if we do get to a recruitment next episode. Who are we discussing and why did they pick that person? Because I do feel like there's some candidates on the board, but I, you know, you look at the top of the screen here, we still have like this for the 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 10 up here are like the reality TV alums. And we still have a lot of them on the board that could be picked, but also we have a lot of them that I think are completely clear of any suspicion and then we have a couple that you could pick but because i think this is a question that is coming so we can just dive into the questions at this point scally uh one of the questions i did flag earlier was um should they be recruiting kevin and i feel like a lot of people think kevin i think kevin is the worst person to recruit at this point i think kevin is the exact type of player that will come in and aim to win the game without you I do not think he just works with you, Kumbaya. I think he will he will kick you out if he can. Yeah, I don't want someone who I think is a good game player to have just as much information as me. I want them to at least have the disadvantage of having, you know, as little, like, less information. Uh, because Kevin is someone that I think is going to come in and be very self-interested. And even if I'm a trader and he's a trader and my name com- comes up, I could see Kevin being like, yeah, what about that one? Like, maybe we should vote them out uh, and, and give me a little bit more cover in, like, actively mm-hmm. getting a trader out. So, uh, no, absolutely, I would never recruit Kevin. Yeah, I wouldn't either, which does leave a small pool. Again, if you were going for someone from the reality TV realm, there's not a lot of people you can go to. Um, at this point, like, if you were to recruit Gerline, I think Gerline's someone who will stay loyal to Koozie. I don't think we'll, like, try and burn Koozie, for example, but I also don't think she will get sussed and banished before Koozie. So it's like a double-edged sword of, she'll work with us, but also she will outlast me. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a little bit tough because also I don't know how you're going to plant that seed of Gerlin is bad with Kevin also there, mm-hmm. you know? You, usually the people like a Gerlin or a Leroy or a Mickey, uh, at least what we've seen on the show, where it's like, they're so nice. They would make the perfect trader because no one would ever suspect them. That's mm-hmm. like in a round where you don't really have any other reads. And so you're just throwing things at the wall. And usually that ends up being earlier. So I think that the people who uh, are less likely to be suspected become very dangerous late game. And so if they're not already out, that's not someone that I would want to recruit and rely on them getting voted out before. Me. Although if the preview is anything to look at and they're talking about targeting some quiet people maybe this is the best time to recruit a quiet person yeah. like you know what it's quiet season come in <laughs> we're gonna move <laughs> you out immediately but come in um okay so another question we have here uh from victoria do you think kevin loki suspects koozie but is keeping mum about it so scally do you think kevin thinks koozie is a traitor and is just not saying anything <sighs> Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say because I feel like the Traders Canada is doing a good job of showing us more of the players' thoughts uh, that I think some other series might hide from us um, mm-hmm. a- in order to keep you know us in the dark a little longer. But I, I-, and I think that like maybe uh, it's hard to know. I think he'd probably be playing this exactly the same. But if I were to bet, I don't think he knows right now. No, I I feel like if he knew, they would let us in on it that he knows because. They've not shied away from letting us see the meta gaming and the layers of strategy that he's putting out there. He's openly admitting to choking in the challenge and he's they're not making it seem like, oh, it's all part of a grand plan. So I feel like they wouldn't hide that from us at this point. I really don't. That being said, there's also a world where a part of me thinks he thought, okay, someone from the Fierce Four trader, let me go find the other trader, befriend them as well. Then I'm covered on both sides. 
That way, they're not going to want to get rid of me. That's also a world I could see Kevin yeah. operating in. But until I see it, I don't think I'm going to ride that um, theory because, again, it's not fully like confirmed it's, or anything. It's hard because you never know with editing. Like, if for all we know, Kevin either is like, okay, there's like a 50% chance or a 100% chance or a 0% mm -hmm. chance. Like, any of them could be true. And like, Koozie does well in the game and Kevin ends up like going home at a banishment or a murder or whatever. And like it never actualizes on screen. So there's no point in showing. And like, let's just make Koozie look like, a, you know, uh, no one ever suspected her. But mm. um, it, it's hard. I, again, I think if I were to bet there is, you know, the meta gaming part of Kevin maybe is like, well, one of us has to be. But I don't know that he is, uh, you know, so set on it being Koozie necessarily. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously the other thing where he brings up uh, Mike's name at the round table, given everything he explained leading up to that round table. I do not think for a second that he necessarily thinks Mike is a traitor based on the strategy he's trying to pull. So I see another question here that uh, Mike may have been that what he said about Mike may have been a good read, but it is, is it putting him more at risk for being killed tonight? I don't think he knows that at all. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But you know, Q five weeks from now when we exit interview Kevin and he's like, yeah, I thought Koozie was the trader from day one. And also I thought Mike was the trader and I brought it out. So we'll find out all the cl clearance we need later on. But for now, I do not think either of those things at the moment. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, you know, it's guesswork at this point, but that's where I'm at. Yeah. And okay. So one last question, Scally, you're from mm -hmm. Neil. Who would be a good recruit? Let's follow this exercise real quick. Obviously, two weeks in now, back to back, we've suggested some recruits and that hasn't happened. Now, everything we've seen, we get a little bit more clarity on these players. If they have to bring one person into the fold, who do you think should be the person? Huh. Um, I don't know. I don't want to just say May again, even though I do think that she's a really good option, obviously, as another reality TV person, as someone who's already had a lot of sus on her uh, and probably will get voted out before them. Um, but again, for like Mike should be really worried about not having a male trader already voted out or that can be voted out before him. And like, you know, uh, Leroy, like Mickey, Kevin, like Dom, like I don't see any reason why they're going to get voted anytime soon. So is there value in recruiting Trevon? Maybe that if they're going with a guy, I think Travon is the one for Mike that will benefit him the most. If Koozie's going to be picking one, I think picking May makes the most sense because, again, we've talked about kind of the requirements you want as a tra when you're bringing in someone as a trader. You're either a bringing in someone you can immediately push out who has suspicion on him and you can immediately get a trader off the board out the gate. That's one revolving door action. B, the other option is getting someone that could get voted out before you ideally but also doesn't have enough pull to switch the tables on you and get you out may as of this moment doesn't seem like she has that pull to like lead a six person charge to get people out but the numbers are dwindling so if may has four people that might be just about enough to get someone out the next round table so you got to be weary of that but then someone like kevin who's clearly shown to have a lot of influence you don't want that person and you especially don't want someone who is a mega mind strategist because they can just plan your demise. So it's tough. It's a tough direction to go. The only way I could see going with the person who's like a really, really strong strategist from the faithful side is if you are shown to have such a tight bond with them that you do not think they would get rid of you. Then it's like, screw it, bring them in. Let's work together. Two minds are better than one. We'll ride it out. We'll make it to the distance. But yeah. The other one I'm thinking of that would be interesting if ignoring the like metagame of like gender, like the gender of the traders and the reality of TV, all of it would be mm -hmm. Mary because I feel like Mary is someone who's very active at these round tables. And so neutralizing that would be great for the traders where she's not necessarily targeting you as openly. But also, like, imagine Mary gets voted out as, and after she accepts becoming a traitor, and they're all like, we knew it! We knew Mary was we, a traitor! Yeah! <laughs> that Honestly, that would also, I feel like it would be interesting, because that could metagame both ways, where they wouldn't think, hmm, would they have picked three women for traitors? I don't know. And then, hmm, would they have picked three non-reality TV people for traitors? I don't know. So that could help both of them out if Mary's the one they mm -hmm. pick, and, and Mary goes out. If, again, people are thinking of metagame, stuff like that, I will tell you, Scally, this is where I would lose the most sleep playing traders. If I was there, 
figuring out how did they make the decisions based on what's in front of me. So my worst nightmare, aside from the fact that a half and half season would be the worst because I feel like I'm going to be in a bad spot no matter what, would be figuring out how did they pick the traders and how many from each side did they pick and all that stuff would be horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be tough. I mean, <laughs> it's hard. I actually really want a season of the traders where they do just like pick three women. You know, yeah, uh, I would ideally, love it. Make it so that you can't metagame that stuff at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally not three men for me personally, but uh, <laughs> 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 it can happen once, like one time only. Um, but three but, men first, then do yeah. that one if you want to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you break the mold, then the options really open up for the game. And I think that it does your future seasons a lot more good if this is going to become a, you know, a, a success both on like, uh, you know on your national version but also internationally for the traders yeah which i did see traders canada is doing really well in the ratings i believe there is the fourth fourth mm. most watched show right now so shout out traders canada doing your thing i did see some sad news from other traders uh shores scally unfortunately looks like traders australia has not been renewed as of yet uh, yeah oh. i had a seemed some doom and gloom around traders australia so i'm sad i'm not ready i'm not ready to say goodbye to a franchise hopefully some other network picks them up but we'll see no confirmation there i don't know if new zealand's been renewed as of yet sadly so hmm. that's also not the way hey, traders us is coming back soon yay hey yeah there's we got a bunch holding on um i'll be most sad to lose the hosts that's what it is it's like there's there's a bunch of traders out there but be sad to lose our little traders AU host. This is how I felt when I, I lost Matt Chisholm when Survivor <laughs> New Zealand didn't get renewed. I was like, oh no, bye. <laughs> um, so if forced to recruit, Neil says it would also be interesting to pick somebody you think would refuse. That's a gamble, though. If Ooh. I'm like, if I'm like, hmm, you know what? Let me pick Dom because Dom will never uh, take the cake and join us. Oh wait, Dom, hello. You joined? You said yes. Ooh, did not think hmm. about that. Hmm. Hi, Dom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do we get rid of you now? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um. Interesting. It's so hard because. You would think no one would say no. <laughs> like that seems like the move, right? But there are people that exist in this world that would say no. Um, so I don't know. It's very yeah. We've seen instances of people saying no on other franchises. We've also, in our exit interview last week, I believe, with Gerpyar, fully asked them if you were recruited, what would you have said? He said, I would have said no. I'm here to play as a faithful. I don't think I could have done the traders thing. So I think there's people that would say no. I feel like the standard would be, well, if I say no, they're going to murder me. So let me just say yes um, it, more often than not. But it's such a tough, such a tough uh, way to go. I feel like there's a lot of people on the board that I still do not know enough about to even be able to tell you if they would say yes or no. Yeah. No, I agree. I definitely agree with that. And I think um, Liana might have said it um, when guesting on one of these podcasts where it was like, it is much, much easier to make it deep in the game as a trader where you're surviving on half the rounds mm -hmm. like anyway and you're controlling the thing but it seems harder to win the game ultimately as a trader uh because of you know just the meta of all of it like there has to be one more here there has to be this there has to be that so you need a, to accomplish a lot of things over the course of the season to set yourself up to win and otherwise like i can see the appeal in being a faithful where it might actually be easier to win if you're lucky to make it that far it's a lot less stress because the game's already stress. And as a trader, you have to, it's weird because it's like, you know, you're not a faithful. So you have to pretend to be, but that's almost harder than just being a faithful. Um, so I feel like, whereas someone like Kuzi feel like is doing a good job of it. I feel like we did see Mel B struggle with this a little bit where you have to like walk this tightrope of, all right, don't celebrate too hard when we do this, but then don't be too sad here. Don't overdo that. It's such a mind game that some people might want the bliss of not having to even factor that into their day to day. Yeah. Whereas I'm like, I think I like <laughs> uh, having control and therefore that's when I'll be less stressed. So mm -hmm. I don't remember if Kuzi is a Capricorn or not, but I think that uh, having control is, you know, so it's very much about different personality types and what works for you. Yeah. I I'm of the mindset of even when it comes to other games. I don't need the power. I just need to know where the power is so I can navigate it. So if I'm a mm -hmm. trader, I'm fine with that because I can just 
play my faithful game, knowing full well where the other traders are and whatever happens, happens. I don't care. Mm. Um, so out of sight, out of mind. Anyway, all right, Scally, we've been on here long enough. Let's get out of here. Let the people know where can they find you and what are the projects you have going on at the moment. Ooh, people can find me on Twitter at Brian underscore Scally or on Twitch at twitch.tv slash B Scally. Myself and Matt Ligori have branched out and started our own uh, feed for the challenge coverage that we're doing. So uh, at pod free agents on Twitter is where you can find all the links, but it's the free agents podcast talking about challenge 39, which has been fun so far people should jump on that while you know we're still just getting into the season also just wrapped up the season of the devil's plan with Chappelle, so people should check that out everything is out your binge is ready uh people go there and then i have the pleasure of guesting with you this week for 90 day proper this week so that'll be a lot of fun that's right. That's right. Can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Uh, y'all can find me on Twitter at Puya. You can find me on Twitch, Twitch, TV slash Puya. That's where I am when I am not podcasting. And from November 6th to November 17th, I'm going to be streaming every day. I've got a, I'm a part of an event, an exclusive event that I was invited to. So check out my stream to see what that is all about. I will be putting out some information on that later on as well. Uh, 90 Day, I will be talking to Scally. I have made the decision to make 90 Day Fiancés the other way, a bi-weekly recap, because I feel like there's not enough information slash content to really push out a weekly pod there. So for now, it'll be bi-weekly. And if they change something, I'll switch it right back. It'll be all good. And Big Brother's almost over. But I believe I have my last live feed update of the season coming up this Friday. So you can check me out over there. And last but not least, please watch The Masked Singer re uh, recap because I nearly forgot to plug that. Uh, Masked Singer with Liana. We have a good time. Check that out as well. Please. If you haven't already, go over to robinswebsite.com slash traders. That's T-R-A-I-T-O-R-S. And leave us a review. It is a baby in the world of uh, feeds on this network. You know, this started over up in the summer. So if you can leave any reviews, five stars especially, would be very much appreciated. It helps other people find the podcast as well. So please go over to robinswebsite.com slash traders and leave a rating and review. We appreciate you hanging out with us tonight here in Traders Tower. We hope you had a good time. Everyone go geek out some tic-tac-toe because we're done for now. We'll see y'all next week. But until then, take care. Have a good one. Bye.